right. Carlos Irrade, benvenuti, benvenidos, bienvenue, welcome, yokoso, and welcome to the third Glasgow Live event. My name is Marcos, and it is a pleasure to be here with you today to share my story of how language unlocked my life. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to go over where I began, how life unfolded that allowed me to become a language learning lover, as well as leave you with some helpful hints, tips, and tricks that might allow you to uh, spark a new love of language learning for yourself or restart or rekindle one that you previously left behind. So without further ado, let's get started. Now, being the performer that I am, today's presentation, or should I say performance, or whatever you want to call it, has been structured in four acts. Act one, Greek American Jersey boy. Act two, the international American. Act three, becoming a language locksmith. And act four, helpful tips and tools. Now, before we get into that, first things first, pop quiz. Let's get set. So here we go. I'm going to set the clock for a minute here. And now let's get those gears moving. If I want to go launch a poll, here we go. Poll number one. So what do you call someone who knows three languages? What do you call someone who knows two languages? And what do you call someone who only knows one language? Feel free to put your answers in the poll and we'll see which one comes out on top. Now, I don't know where in the world you're calling from, but this is just a little something to get that, uh, get the gears moving. You know, I know maybe it's late at night, maybe it's early in the morning. Either way, I figure it's always fun to start some sort of presentation with something a little bit more engaging than just a hello, my name is this, and this is what I'm here to tell you about. So we got 10 more seconds on the clock. Let's see. All right. And that is that. It's going to put the timer away. And now we are going to end the poll. All right. Let's share these results. So. What do you call someone who knows three languages? Trilingual, very good. What do you call someone who knows two languages? Bilingual, well done. And now last one. What do you call someone who knows only one language? Now, although this is very good in terms of what you put as the answer, a little bit of a punchline here is that, no, we're not gonna go with monolingual. We're gonna go with an American. So this is a punchline that I've heard quite a few times before, but over the course of this presentation, I'd like to show how an American or anyone for that matter can, uh, you know, turn a punchline like this on its head. So without further ado, let me move this poll window out of my way and let's get started. Act number one, the Greek American Jersey boy. So I was born and raised in New Jersey in the USA. English being my native language, of course, but I had a lot of Greek influence growing up. So my father is a native Greek speaker from the island of Crete, which some consider to be both the biggest and best island in Greece, but uh, they might be biased, who knows? And my mother speaks Greek as well, despite being a native English speaker born in New York. And that's because her mother is a native Greek speaker from Gavala a lovely port city in the north of Greece near Thessaloniki. And when you put those two folks together, you end up with a little baby like this at the New York City Independence Day Parade, dressed to the nines with a cute little pin that says, kiss me, I'm Greek. So that's how I started back in the States way back when. And now if you've seen the film, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, many stereotypes are true, including weekly Greek school. So although Greek was never my primary language growing up, I did go to Greek school once a week at my church. Now, the school was not just for the sake of language learning, but also for cultural acquisition. Because how else do you get a bunch of small kids from halfway across the world to have an appreciation and affinity for a tiny country of 11 million people, which they may have never been to before, which was in my case, being born in the States. So the school and church community serve the purpose of nurturing young people who are proud of their culture and heritage. Because honestly, if you don't do the work and try to get these kids together, it's not gonna be easy for them to grow up in the USA and retain any sense of being Greek at all. So fast forward a few years from that baby photo and here I am back at the New York City Independence Day Parade, now being a flag bearer for my church community, proudly walking along side by side with all my fellow peers. 
Now, along with my Greek upbringing, I also attended school, just like everyone else, in the New Jersey public school system, and I took Spanish classes there. So my exposure to Greek helped a lot with learning Spanish. And I've come to learn later on in life that Spanish and Greek have a very similar phoneme pool. And to put simply, a phoneme is to spoken language what a letter is to written language. It's the distinct unit of a single sound. So as such, I ended up picking up Spanish pretty well due to this overlap of phonemes with Greek, even though I didn't know exactly why at the time. And one occasion that made a, quite a mental mark in my mind was when I first had to use Spanish in the real world. And it was around ninth grade, and I had gone to help build a home in Mexico with a group from my church community. It felt like I was using an appendage I never even acknowledged or realized that I had. But once I was there, it actually became a real thing that I could use on a regular basis. Because the process of fighting to recall words and phrases in Spanish and then produce them in real time stuck with me and frankly made an impact that lasted my entire life since then. And at that point, I had never been to another country as a young adult that required me to speak a foreign language. I'd gone to Greece twice before, but I was only around two or four years old at the time. So I was never really forced to speak the native language in order for me to be understood. I was just a kid, just a baby. And so my first trip to Mexico outside of the US was a monumental experience for me. And that one week in Mexico was my first taste of speaking a foreign language in a real world setting, which helped it settle in the language more than any semester of classes I'd have taken before. Now, aside from languages, music has always been a big part of my life. Now, I started singing classical opera in a professional capacity at the New York City Metropolitan Opera House when I was in fourth grade, around 10 years old. And I never had singing lessons before then either. So this was also my first time singing classically in English, as well as Italian, French, and German on a regular basis. Now, though I didn't always understand what I was singing, I developed a feel for producing languages outside of English and Greek, which was very good for developing what's called an oral posture, being able to shape your mouth to produce the sound that you want to in whatever language you're performing or speaking in. Now, some of the operas that I was in included La Boheme, Turandot, Tosca, Pasifal, Die Zauberflote, Carmen, and War and Peace. And you can see that they have a slew of languages that became part of my regular <laughs> weekly rehearsal. But one thing I do want to note for Die Zauberflote, I was not in that performance in particular, in that opera, excuse me, but I was on the roster for it. And uh, either way, because of all the repetition and all the rehearsal time, the German language was still a part of my upbringing, even though I didn't perform in it as much as the other languages. And that experience is one that I cherish to this day, and I could not thank my parents enough, who I am happy to say were very supportive throughout the entire experience. Now, after completing high school, I ended up going to Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey. Enter the choir robes right there. And as a vocal performance major, I had a diction class that was complementary to my language of study and helped really hyperdrive my acquisition of proper Italian pronunciation. Now, I chose to study Italian because I am also part Italian. I'm a quarter Italian through my mother's side, with my mother's grandparents being Italian immigrants from Bari. Now, all of this comes to show that even though I was primarily focused on singing growing up, once I got into the opera, once I got into Westminster Choir College, through all of these recitals, studio lessons, uh, studio workshops, private lessons and concerts in multiple different languages, it really did play a subversive role in expanding my linguistic capabilities without me really focusing on them that much. And although everything was going in one direction pretty well, one day everything changed. This takes us on to act two, the international American. And there is a very good reason why that's a cruise ship right on front. Now, here we go. Picture it, Lawrenceville, New Jersey, 2012. For any of my Golden Girls fans, yes, that was a Golden Girls reference. I can't help myself. Now, moving on to the next slide. Here we go. This is me, baby face, preparing for my first finals in my third semester of college when I got my first contract offer from Royal Caribbean Productions. That's the entertainment department of the cruise line. So I did what anyone would do, and I accepted it, and then ended up being flown out to Florida within 48 hours, already rehearsing for a week before setting sail aboard the ship. And over the course of my cruise ship career, I've had the privilege of traveling to over 30 countries across four continents, 
and connecting with people from all different walks of life, creeds, and cultures. And this is just what I want to show about this uh, photo is my very first what's called an office run, where you end up rehearsing your shows throughout the rehearsal period. This was back in North Hollywood, I want to say, in Florida, and they moved eventually. And the concert, excuse me, the office run is where you get to perform your shows for the entire office. So this is my first experience, my first professional gig as a cruise ship singer. And this is the beginning of what would become my young adulthood, basically. Now, I wouldn't be the man I am today if it were not for my seven years working in this industry. I started singing on Royal Caribbean cruise ships when I was 19 and worked with them until I was 26. So basically the bulk of my entrance to adulthood. And although I feel conflicted a bit about the industry as a whole, the cruise ship experience of waking up in a foreign country every day undeniably impacted me for life. And I was inspired to get more immersed in the cultures that resonated the most with me. So that includes Greek and Italian, other European cultures like French and Spanish, and even East Asian cultures like Japanese. Now, if you can look at this photo and this amazing wardrobe, I have to say, unfortunately, I did not get to keep it. Maybe one of these days I'll create my own cruise ship clothing line. But for now, I just have these photos to reminisce. Now, moving forward, I do have to say that one country in particular of all the ones that I've been to had a big impact on my language learning trajectory. So Asia had a bit of a familiarity to it for me since there's a large population of Chinese, Indian, Korean, Vietnamese, and Filipino immigrants where I grew up. So I had a very big East Asian pool of friends that shared their culture with me. Now, I had an affinity for Japan in particular through cultural exposure, through anime, video games, music, and the like. So when I went to Japan for the first time on my second ship contract, I was impressed with the culture and the language that I found myself in. And I think my choice to learn Japanese of all the East Asian languages I was surrounded with had something to do with the fact that I'm a singer and I'm just influenced by sound itself. And I remember being in the middle of Fukuoka, which was the first Japanese city I ever went to, and hearing the sounds of the language and the city all around me and just... There I am, my very first day with Tochigi Shrine behind me. And after I considered Mandarin and Hangul, the languages where I was around in China and South Korea, I decided I wanted to take on the task of learning Japanese. And most importantly, what I took away from that was the immersion experience back in 2015, finding myself on the literal opposite side of the planet from where I grew up was the spark that reignited my passion for language learning that has been keeping me going ever since, knowing that I could be halfway across the world, excuse me, on the other side of the world and begin to understand a language and a culture completely foreign to me just by going all in and really focusing on not just what I was seeing in the written language, but also what I was hearing and trying to produce it myself to the people I met every day. And now, that was my cruise ship experience, although that wrapped up at around 2019, right before a certain, uh, let's say, global hiatus came to town. As opposed to the majority of my upbringing in the United States and my cruise ship experiences, in the U.S. and on cruise ships, English is the main language, and you don't need to necessarily speak other languages. These past few years since I've moved to Europe have included spending a part of my year in Greece, part of my year in Italy, and now with Switzerland involved, that throws German and French into the mix. Don't even get me started on Switch German. I am not even thinking about that yet. But uh, I thrive now from all of this because I personally enjoy developing my foundations for these languages as a natural byproduct of living daily life here. And this also helps me in a professional sense because I love singing classical music or the art song genre in general. And I'm looking forward to developing my future shows with them as a part of my core repertoire. And now here's a photo I have with my sister here in Lucerne. And one reason I love this photo is just because a few hours before we had met up in Milano and excuse me, Milan. And then we're here two hours later, now speaking in a German uh, region of Switzerland. And then the next day we went down to Lugano back to speaking Italian. So this com complex tapestry of cultures and languages that I'm finding myself in Europe forces me to become more adept at speaking these languages on an everyday basis without even needing to think about it. It's just, oh, two hours away, now I have to learn Italian. Oh, two hours away, now I have to speak German. And that's one thing that I'm finding very beneficial about my time here in Europe and also sharing these experiences with family and friends who come and visit me from across the pond. And I love opening up the world to them because these people are my world. So it's always important to give back to the people who made you who you are. Now, speaking of my professional aims, I am passionate about performing the great American songbook and jazz standards for people 
all over the world. Now in Europe, there aren't that many people from New Jersey who can perform, you know, Frank Sinatra in his native dialect, which clearly, if you couldn't tell by now, I can. And I like that I can now both benefit from where I'm living and can also contribute to where I'm living, wherever that might be. Because even though I'm not on cruise ships anymore, my life is still very much multilingual and I don't wanna change that anytime soon. And thankfully, my language keychain, which we'll discuss further, full of different keys and charms that I've developed over the years, enables me to incorporate international influences in my personal and professional endeavors. And now this clip you see here, this thumbnail is from one of my most recent performances back in New Jersey, where I actually, again, gave back to my local community through my international influences by creating a whole set within the show that I like to call the International American. And if you go to the Glossable website and you look at one of their more recent blog posts, at least at the time of publishing here, you'll find that this clip is playable there and you'll hear me speaking and singing in multiple languages from English to Greek, Italian, and even French. So this just goes to show how language learning can not only enrich your life personally, but even professionally so, and allows you to just take in things from all over the world and give back to the community that allowed you to take those first steps. And this brings us on to act three, becoming a language locksmith. So language keys. Sometimes you have language keys that unlock a different way of living beyond your previous realm of possibility. That might mean unlocking a different country or connecting to a particular cultural group in your own country. Who knows? Your keys are the languages that are the most important to you. So currently for me, they're English and Greek. This allows me to continue pursuing personal and professional opportunities from back in the US as well as Greece. And previously, one of my keys was Italian because I was spending part of my time in Italy for the last two to three years. But shifting priorities calls for me to put that on the back burner right now while prioritizing German instead, now that I've been living in Zurich. And now, as you can see, one of the reasons that I made these keys a little bit different in design is because the English and Greek keys are far more simple in size, excuse me, smaller in size, but more complex in terms of the blade and what they can unlock in life. While the Italian one is a little bit longer, a little bit more cumbersome or difficult to have on your person. And the blade at the bottom is a little bit simpler because that's the expanse of my Italian at this point. But over time, I can develop this, I can sharpen it, I can make it more complex in the blade so I can open up more opportunities and make it smaller in time and hone it and make it easier to carry and use on my person. This is the sort of physical analogy that I use when it comes to how languages can be keys that you carry on your person for wherever you go in the world. And now the second part of this language keychain are the charms. So the charms are languages that are nice to have on your keychain that you can connect with people over. They're not necessarily essential for daily use, but they provide joy and they enable unique connections with people without requiring much language learning on your part. So my current charms would be German, Japanese, French, and Spanish. And as I mentioned before, I'm currently developing my German charm to forge it into a key so that I can have a better quality of life in Zurich. And if things go well in there, who knows, then maybe I'll work on refining that rough key to become far more complex and far more simple to carry on my person and use on a daily basis. Now, before deciding which languages you want to create keys and charms for, it's key, yes, pun intended, to understand the different facets of life that a well-designed language keychain can assist you in actualizing. So with them in mind, you can chart a course that is tailored to your specific lifestyle aims. They are your physical life, your psychological life, your economic life, your social life, and your spiritual life. So let's take a look. Now, Learning languages has numerous physical benefits, including enhancing your hearing ability as you become attuned to different sounds and tones. Additionally, it can improve your motor skills and coordination as you learn to pronounce new words and sounds. Now, I personally think production, even without comprehension, is one of the most important things to do. You don't need to understand in full everything you're saying, quite frankly, when you're just learning a language. Even if you don't remember what each word means, it's important that you're getting it out of your mouth because your face, your jaw, your ears, your neck, these are all interconnected by muscles. And this whole musculature needs to be used because you need to exercise it in order to be able to produce the language and feel more comfortable in it, not just on an intellectual level, but on a physiological level as well. As a singer, of course, I'm always making all sorts of sounds as part of warm-ups or exercises. So now, as long as I have enough input exposure to a language, 
I already have the technical ability to reproduce the sounds I hear because I put in three decades of vocal training. Now I have this innate ability to hear things that people don't since hearing is a tool of my trade. But if you aren't a professional singer who spent 30 years training their voice and ears, then this is something you have to develop. But in my opinion, it's extremely worthwhile to do so. And maybe who knows, at the end of it, you could have your own applause on a stage wearing a canary yellow top hat and tails with confetti spraying all over you. Who knows? We all have different goals in life. Maybe that's one of yours. I have to say it was a pretty fun experience, the one I never envisioned for myself. Moving on to the next unlock you can have for your life. Language learning has several psychological benefits that can positively impact your well-being and cognitive abilities. It enhances memory and cognitive function as it requires the brain to process and retain new information. It improves problem-solving skills as learners must navigate unfamiliar grammatical structures and vocabulary. It fosters cultural appreciation and understanding, allowing you to connect with different perspectives and worldviews. And it provides a sense of accomplishment and fulfillment and contributes to overall happiness and well-being. One thing that I do like the most, it was one example of that. In Through My Language Studies just came to me where the Greek word for perfect, teia, has a similar root to the verb to finish or to complete. Or I've completed, teliosha, eliono, whatever conjugation you want to use. But that root word or the root of those words, teia, teliono, teliosha, what it means to me is that as far as the ancient Greeks were concerned who came up with this language way back when, it makes me feel that you can't complete something in, as far as the ancient Greeks were concerned until you completed it to perfection. So it's just these funny little nuances that you get to learn from a language just by, you get to learn from a culture just by studying the language. And my language studies have enabled me to appreciate those little nuances and understand people of various backgrounds on a deeper level as a result. Now, language learning also offers significant economic benefits. It enhances job prospects and career opportunities as employers increasingly seek multilingual professionals in a globalized economy who can then command higher salaries and rates compared to monolingual counterparts. It promotes entrepreneurship and innovation as language skills enable you to tap into new markets and connect with diverse customers and partners. It stimulates economic growth by facilitating trade and tourism as businesses and travelers can better, inter, uh, better navigate international markets. And it reduces language barriers, pretty obvious, since it fosters smoother communication and cooperation in an international business and dip uh, diplomatic setting. Now, this is beneficial to both your domestic and commercial economies, being that your domestic economy is the one that you bring to your home, whether that's how you raise your children, how you speak with your partner, what kind of things you keep around the house, what kind of music you listen to. All of these things are your domestic economy that can benefit from your language learning. And then the commercial economy is one that's a little bit more straightforward, what you have to offer the commercial market and the value that you get to receive in return. And this photo here is my first JLPT N5 certificate, which I had acquired so that I could go teach English in Japan. That's just one example of how a language skill that you can learn completely on your own get a certification for it can unlock a completely new way of life. And although I did secure that contract, had the visa lined up and everything to go, I ended up taking another cruise ship contract that unlike my previous, or should I say my very first experience where I had 48 hours to get on the ship or get onto the contract, this contract over here that stopped me from going to Japan that I prepared for for years, ended up seeing me back on the ship within 12 hours of that first call with my casting director. So sometimes divine intervention has other plans for you, but that doesn't mean that you can't make forward progress in any direction of your choosing, regardless of what someone above might have in store for you. Now, moving on to the next one. Language learning offers a myriad of social benefits that can enhance your life in various ways. The cross-cultural understanding allows you to better appreciate and connect with people from diverse backgrounds. This, explain, this expands your social network, enabling you to interact with a broader range of individuals and build meaningful relationships. It enhances communication skills, not just in your target language, but also in your native language as you reflect on the inner workings of your tongue that you might not have understood or realized before. And it opens new doors to new opportunities like travel, employment, and education pursuits that enrich your social and personal life. Now, for me in this example, here I am in the Italian countryside, when my sister and I were hosted by a family for a month at their beautiful farmstead in the mountainside of Benevento in San Leocho del San. Now that lady right there is the lady of the house named Signora Elena, who spoke little to no English. And this became my baptism by fire moment in Italy, just trying to use Italian every day to converse with her. And 
the food that she was making was fantastic. And she loved experimenting with everything that she grew. And she would try to explain to me in Italian the way that these foods are used in traditional and innovative recipes that she would make. And the feeling that I have when I sat at her table and was able to tell her that her meal smelled delicious in her language was immensely gratifying because I gave her a compliment on her cooking in her native tongue. And speaking to someone in their native language allows you to communicate directly with their heart rather than just their mind. Now, this first compliment went straight to her heart and I'm happy to say that we've been family friends ever since. And now on to our last point, not to get preachy in any way, shape or form, but I have found that language learning offers a myriad of spiritual benefits as well that can enrich your inner life and foster a deeper connection with the world. So it enhances self-awareness and introspection as you gain insights into your own thoughts, emotions, and cultural biases. It promotes mindfulness and presence as it requires you to focus on the present moment, the present word, the present phrase, and pay attention to the subtle nuances of the language. It cultivates empathy and compassion as you develop a greater understanding of different cultures and perspectives. And it can provide a sense of purpose and meaning as you embark on a journey of personal growth and discovery. Now, it also fosters a sense of interconnectedness and unity as you realize that language is a shared human experience that transcends all boundaries. I personally never intend to stop learning and acquiring different languages because doing so expands me as a person and expands how much of the world I can connect with. And I try to bring my family back to our roots in any way that I can. Although I grew up in a Greek community, as discussed before, we also have this Italian heritage that I want to do good by. And I want to eventually have a reason to bring my family back to places that we might not have been to together because these are part of our shared heritage. And eventually I'd love to go back to body together with my whole family and they might feel more comfortable doing so now that I've made the effort to speak Italian and they can feel comfortable knowing that there's someone who knows how to guide them and communicate with the locals. This photo being an example of me bringing my family back. This is my younger sister again. We took a day trip, excuse me, a weekend trip to body and did a cooking class in orecchiette, which means little ear in Italian. This is the local specialty pasta of Bari. And this woman here who's teaching us happens to be a local, if not national celebrity, who has been featured in Gucci ads and all sorts of things because these women, these nonnas, are making orecchiette every day, day in, day out, keeping these traditions alive. And I hope to continue that passing on of tradition through my own special way. If not through pasta, then through language. And this brings us to act four. Now that I've shared my language journey and my perspectives on forging a language keychain, I want to address some of the common questions and concerns I hear from people at different stages in their language learning journey. So here are the common questions and concerns I hear from people regarding language learning. One, how can I improve my confidence when speaking another language? Two, how can I go about learning a language independently? Three, how can I maintain motivation when learning alone, especially at a lower level? And four, how can I connect with others, build lasting bonds, and become a lifelong learner? Now, if you're new to learning uh, language learning and feeling lost, start with the basics. Focus on native input, pronunciation, and essential vocabulary and grammar as needed. Immerse yourself in the language through podcasts, audiobooks, music, movies, and books at your level. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. They're step one and they're part of the language learning process throughout the entire journey. If you're new to language learning and have a routine that's working, practice speaking regularly, even if it's just with yourself. Challenge yourself with more complex grammar and vocabulary. And if you can, find a language partner or tutor online to help you practice conversation. Now, if you're not a beginner, but you don't feel you're able to converse smoothly, Focus on improving your listening and comprehension skills. Practice speaking in front of a mirror or with a language partner in person or online. And if you can, join a language learning community or class online to get feedback and support in real time. Now, if you're able to use the target language for most everyday tasks, congratulations. And here's what you can consider next. Setting specific goals for yourself, such as being able to give a presentation in the language. Maybe next time I'll be giving a presentation fully in Greek, who knows? Uh, you might want to immerse yourself in the current culture by reading news articles, watching TV shows, and listening to podcasts. And practice speaking in real-life situations by joining or attending cultural re culturally relevant groups and events. If I haven't beat that horse dead enough, real-life situations are going to be the glue that keeps your language practice together. And also, 
if you feel you're able to use the target language in a professional setting, kudos to you. You're at a high tier of language learners. But if I may, here's how I think you can improve even further. Set more specific goals for yourself, such as being able to give a presentation in the language. And you might want to expand your vocabulary to include more industry-specific terms. You might want to participate in professional development opportunities, like giving presentations, attending courses, workshops, or uh, courses or workshops in the target language, and attending industry events and conferences to network with professionals who speak your target language. So those are some of the tips and tricks that I have for people at different le uh, levels in the language learning game. And with that said, we got one more thing, one more pop quiz, because as we wrap things up, you might be wondering how fluent I am in the languages I've mentioned previously. You might even think I have a level of fluency in a language you couldn't imagine achieving for yourself with everything that I've done so far in my life. Now, what level of fluency do you think I'm at in my Glossika studies? As a reminder, I am only native in English, so that's not on there. But everything else has different levels of fluency based on my personal experience, Greek obviously being the most, but uh, so that might give something a little bit away there. But this is also to know this is in Glossika itself. So some things might not be 100% reflexive or reflective of what I actually can speak, but they are pretty good markers. So time is up. All right, we have just about everyone's answers. And now I'm going to end the poll. And let's go ahead and share these results. So for number one, what Glossika level do you think I'm in Japanese? I see a lot of A1, but mostly A2. Some people even going so far as B1 or B2. Next for Spanish, we have a lot of A2, B1, B2, and even C1. Next for French, A1, A2 got the most. B1 and B2 came in tied. Number four, what about German? A1, A2 got quite a bit. B1 and B2, oh, my German friend in Zurich will be flattered. Uh, let's see about Italian. Not even a single A, B1, B2, and C1. My family friends in Italy will be happy to hear that. And last but not least, how about Greek? We have B2, C1, not even a single A. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. And now the reason I did this poll is because I want to show you how possible it is to live a life of this level of internationality with a level of fluency that you might not think at first is required. You might be surprised. So here we go. There it is. In Glasgow, as far as anyone is concerned, I am not passed in A1. And I've been able to live in Greece, live in Italy, move to Switzerland, learn Japanese to get certified in it, speak Spanish enough to barter my way in Mexico, and be able to share my love for these languages and perform them to people from all over the world. So the reason I'm showing you this, it's not to pat myself on the back, clearly. I will admit my Greek and Japanese levels in Glasgow might be less, or I would say probably are less than my actual levels on account that Greek I've been speaking my whole life. And Japanese, I actually started learning with Glasgow two years prior to them coming out with the app. So this only marks my progress in the app. And also I did studies on my own. So those two might not be 100% accurate, but everything else I would say is pretty darn accurate. Maybe not Spanish as well because of my public school experience, but this just goes to show how much you can accomplish in life in terms of your language learning journey with just maybe five, 10, 20 minutes a day, however much you can put in. Because if you put in 1% progress in a day for these languages, you could very well be passing A1 level within a year. Maybe A1 and A2 in a year, depending on how much you go and invest yourself. Me being spread across six different languages, obviously it's gonna take me longer to advance in any of them. But if you're more invested in a single language, there's no limit to how much you can progress on a regular basis if you focus your efforts and just stick to it. And this brings me to my next point to show that even if you're starting from zero, there's plenty of progress to be made very quickly and very sustainably. And these are my three steps for long-term success. Now, excuse me for being a little bit crass, but this is my jersey in New York coming out. Step one, shut up in every way. Any excuse that you have, you don't want to hear it. Your mother doesn't want to hear it. No one wants to hear it. If you want to do something, you're going to set your mind to it. Say yes from the beginning and everything else will take care of itself. And it's also a good reality check. Do you really want to invest the time in this language for whether you want to make it a key or a charm? Those are the important things that I mentioned before in determining how you want to structure your language keychain, which you can then decide from the beginning 
if you think it's worthwhile to invest that time from the start. Step two, once you made that decision, show up. That's half the battle. After you've decided, yes, I'm gonna learn Japanese, it's gonna be one of my charms, just for fun, just for me and connecting with people, show up every day and put in the work. And that's where step three comes in, shaping up. Just a little bit at a time. It could be one, as we say, plus one. So it's not about competing with anyone else in this life, it's just who you were the day before. Are you gonna improve yourself? Are you gonna shape up into someone that you wanna be? If the answer is yes, then you're gonna see some fantastic results day after day. And here's my journey so far. Across six languages, I've put in 108,495 reps. This is since 2017. This does not include the amount of reps I've put with the PDF and MP3s way back in the good old days of Glasgow before the app came to be. So this is just every day putting in the work, showing up and getting down to it. And this is one of the reasons why I love Glasgow because you just have to show up, press learn new items or press review and you're gonna make progress whether you want to or not. So it's kind of like going to the gym. You might not wanna feel, you might not feel like you wanna go there at the beginning, but once you leave the gym after a good training session, you'll be glad you did. And a hundred thousand reps later, you'll be better off for doing so. So with everything that we've discussed about how the journey of learning language can unlock a life beyond your wildest dreams, let's revisit that opening punchline one more time. What do you call someone who only knows one language? No, not monolingual. No, at this point, I don't think we could call them an American. I'd like to say that they're missing out. So thank you so much to the Glasgow team for inviting me to present today. And of course, thank you for attending. I hope this presentation was as insightful for you as it was enjoyable for me to share. Now, for more information on Glasgow or my endeavors, please feel free to visit any of these links. Thank you and enjoy the journey.